The conference, there's history in all men's lives. <clears throat> the conference to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the first edition, or let's say of the edition of the first volume of the new Slovenian biographical lexicon, but also as a final conference of the project in Tavia, Intangible and Tangible Cultural Heritage Analysis and Visualization. Uh, it is my pleasure to give the floor to the director of the research center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, Professor Dr. Otto Luther. Hello, good morning. I'm asking myself where we lost this academic 15 minutes before the start of every event. Well, um, thank you for inviting me um, to the opening of this meeting, the conference. Not only because um, this gives me opportunity to welcome you, uh, but uh, because of the topic. Um, believe it or not, as a historian working with uh, biographies, I am generally interested in um, the topics of your project. Like the American uh, historian you surely know, uh, Hayden White, um, I too believe that the personal histories as well as any other interpretation of the past include the basic elements of a story. Uh, which is why I believe there must be a story in all men's life first, uh, the story that um, at one point becomes history. Although this might not be the, the topic of your discussion, I'm still very much interested in your work. Additionally, I would um, like to use this opportunity to thank you, the organizers, uh, organizers of the conference. Uh, organizing the events like this is not just uh, something that we usually do, um, besides gathering and analyzing material, writing articles, um, uh, organizing workshops and a conference to discuss our findings uh, enables uh, us to find someone who's also interested in the topics as we are. And the same goes to, for the meetings of the, uh, meetings connected to the projects. And uh, there is an added value to all this. Um, organizing the meetings like this uh, on a regular basis uh, not only shows uh, that we are doing our job properly, uh, it can also be a sign of vitality uh, of the institute or, institute or the research team that organized it. Uh, finally, uh, I would once again like to welcome you here at the research, cent research center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts and I uh, wish you a pleasant stay in Ljubljana. Right, as they say, let's get down to business. I would like to invite my two very esteemed colleagues, Eva Meyer and Florian Windhager from the Donau Universität Krems, who are the coordinators, the main coordinators of the project in Tavia. Two people I learned from a whole lot. I would like for them to share this next introductory remarks. Um, so, please. And um, how do we do? Okay, you, you know. Okay. As I will be uh, giving a presentation, or let's say an introductory. Well, already we are running into some technical problems. Uh, Hats, can you give us a hand? So as I will be giving a lecture on, let's say, the nature of biography as a scientific discipline, I will keep my part very, very short. So,
So, <clears throat> without much further ado, um, as I already said, this uh, two-day symposium is to commemorate two seemingly not related, but in all actuality very intertwined projects. One of them, as I already said, is the new Slovenian biographical lexicon, and the other one is the project in Tavia. Um, we separated the event into two days. Well, let's say just to keep things simple and manageable. But as I already said, um, the new Slovenian biographical lexicon is not just a traditional biographical project. It's also a project which, um, thanks to a lot of people who are involved with its background, is heavily digital, or let's say our inspiration is for it to become a heavily digital project. Enter Intavia, the project which, which we prepared in uh, several years. Uh, Eva and Florian were the main masterminds behind that, with a whole lot of our colleagues from, uh, from uh, different consortium partners. Biography has always been, let's say, with us. Homer's epics start well, the Iliad starts with the mentioning of Achilles. The Odyssey starts with the mentioning of, well, Odysseus, Ulysses. So centering a narrative around one person is not a novel thing. Here we have a little bit of a, a, little bit of a reminiscence to Homer. Uh, but it was the Renaissance which, as we shall mention later, uh, started compiling um, biographies in a very systematic way. So, for instance, Bazzari's biographies of different artists and scientists. Well, the Slovenian biographical lexicon is doing precisely that. So here, for instance, we have a, a spin-off of the Slovenian biographical lexicon, a book of the Slovenian almanac on the 20th century. So for 100 years now, Slovenian uh, scientists have been compiling biographies of anyone who, well, matters in the Slovenian history and arts and science and so on and so forth. This is roughly the outline of what the Slovenska biografia, the Slovenian biography, looks like now. But it also has a very complex back end, right? So it is only natural I think that we made part of this fascinating project that my two colleagues will present on now. By the way, it's not only a systematic compilation of data on Slovenian personalities, it's also serendipitous discovery. While we were working on one of the persons in the Slovenian biographical lexicon, Pierpaolo Vergerio, we stumbled upon this. So I think that this project is a terribly important opportunity to translate tangible objects of cultural history into, um, uh, well, how shall I put it, into a digitized experience for everyone to share. So I give my floor to Eva now to continue with the Intavia project. Thank you so much. So the idea of the Entavia project is exactly doing that, combining not only biographies, but combining it with also further data. And this idea is quite old, so the Entavia project has been funded by the European Commission and is, uh, comes, there comes together a group of uh, institutions across Europe. And uh, we start from the idea that we have got this process of digitization that started several years ago. And all the collections on cultural heritage and history have been digitized to the web and are avail available in a digitized format nowadays, or many of them at least. The problem that we see is that we have got this kind of data silos. So we have got collections of cultural objects that are aggregated, for example, in Europeana. And on the other side, we have got biographical data. We have got other art historical or historical collections that are separated from 
the, the tangible cultural heritage. And so we really want to draw these two together and build up a bigger knowledge graph that integrates different sources. In the case of our project, this is more concretely four different uh, biographical databases that you see here. So it's the Finnish biography sample, the Dutch biography net, the Austrian prosopographical information system, and last but not least, the Slovenska, Slovenska biographia, so the new Slovenian biographical lexicon. And on the other side, we have got cultural objects from Wikidata and from Europeana that we bring together in a huge knowledge graph. And you can see the knowledge graph there on the posters on the side. Uh, so the huge network that you see there, that's the knowledge graph that we built. But um, we do not stop there by building this knowledge graph, but we also think about possible users of the knowledge graph. Who could use such information? And what are their needs? What kind of processes would they like to um, be supported? How would they like to work with the knowledge graph? And so we came up with this kind of process workflow that starts from searching for cultural information, for objects, but also for actors. Then compiling a collection um, of information, of cultural information, curating this information, bringing in one's own knowledge, analyzing that in a visual way, but also in the end communicating it to a target group. And for the later two, or for the whole process in the end, we tried to build up a platform that helps users that are not too tech heavy to work with this kind of information. And with that, I want to give over to Florian. Thank you. And uh, yes, even though it has been mentioned, it shouldn't be too tech heavy. This might look scary at first sight. It's just a sketch of the whole platform. We hope to introduce um, the relevant parts uh, during today and tomorrow. Um, basically, to just um, walk you through the architecture from left to right, uh, you see we have different sources, obviously, who are consisting of books and or um, documents on the left-hand side, both for biographies and for cultural objects. Um, these have been already digitized, which you can see here, with different databases on a national basis. And Intavia started to draw these sources together to build a sort of integrated knowledge graph, um, indeed, that um, integrates what Eva has mentioned before, the different national biography data sets and various object-oriented data sets. Then, sort of the interface, the user interface comes into play that we have built. It consists largely of three different modules here that you can see, uh, so-called data curation lab, where experts can actually query data, look at it, create new aspects of it, take care of the quality of the data, a so-called visual analytics studio that allows you to look at data that is usually not human readable um, in a visual form. And we have a third module that's called a storytelling suit that allows um, experts actually to find some sort of accessible narrative form for things they discovered, for example, with this so-called Visual Analytics Studio, to communicate these findings to non-experts, um, which are usually grateful for not getting just complex pictures, but also um, well-formed stories. Right. This is just a sneak preview. It might also look a bit confusing at the beginning of the interface that is actually um, geared towards um, expert users. It consists of so-called multiple views that you can see here. And we are currently looking at uh, uh, Pier Paolo Bergerio that has been mentioned at the beginning, where you can see, for example, where he traveled. Um, this is just an aggregated view. We can also look at it uh, with the time-oriented color coding. We see the basic network of things, persons, and institutions connected to Vecerio, and we see a timeline up there with the most important events um, in his life. So this might be a view that is um, supporting experts, 
um, with um, their analysis. But from here you can move forward, for example, and just take out the most important parts, add some uh, pictures and text, and build a story that can be then read either on desktop um, browsers or on mobile browsers. And this would be something that obviously could then help to disseminate your findings to actually make biographies accessible in modern digital times. Right, this is, as I mentioned, just a preview as we are looking forward to walk you through the whole architecture and the tool with, tomorrow, uh, uh, with tomorrow's second day of the workshop uh, that also includes a hands-on part. Right, this is um, just already a historical picture of um, our first uh, conference in Graz where we discussed uh, the current state of the tool from different angles and maybe to just um, sum up some learnings and takeaways we could gather um, and draw together their um, data, either on biographies or objects, is astonishingly scattered. So digitization has started to um, make its way into our archives, but the results are really distributed across different silos. So that's the basic reason why within Tavia we draw to try to link this data and uh, bring um, these different aspects together. Um, this data is mostly not optimized for being read by historians or biographers or humans. That's why we built this interface um, that is largely shifting the burden um, to your visual perception, which is highly trained to see patterns, to just recognize different relations, and visualizations are usually one of the main instruments we have to make data more accessible again. Data is sometimes big and contains many details. In this case, it's important to have something like interfaces supporting so-called scalable reading. That would include so-called distant reading approaches and close reading approaches. In other words, we don't want to just throw visualizations at you, which you have to trust and or which you just have to um, access on an abstract level, but scalable reading means you decide um, on the scale of reception. It means you can also at any time dive into a visualization, look at single objects in more details, you can return to the sources and for example study the biographical texts that have generated these visualizations. Right, as I mentioned, it's sometimes the case that we deal with big data uh, that is rich in, uh, of details. Most of the time, data is scarce. It was one of the most important learnings we had in between. Many biographies have been digitized. Most of the time, we have something like five to uh, ten data points uh, for biographies. I think that's even already above average. Sometimes we just know about the birth and the death. Uh, that's what we have in a structured fashion. So one of the important developments was building up a module that allows you as an expert, as an historian, as a biographer to add data where it is missing. That allows us to have some sort of cycle between data analysis and data curation. And I think it's one of the most important parts that have been introduced to Intavia, to the platform, even though we didn't plan for this uh, in more detail in the beginning. Right, oftentimes, whether existing or um, still in the making, data is uncertain or contested. That's something that is quite obvious to historians or to biographers. In a digital fashion, we also need representations for this kind of incompleteness or uncertainty of data. And that's also something where we work to make this visible. Data, especially in the cultural heritage domain, is autotelic. That's um, a complicated way to say that our data in this domain um, are consisting of objects that have been collected because they are beautiful, because they are valuable, because they are very um, specific cultural objects which shouldn't be hidden. So in this case, we need also our tools to offer close-up views. We shouldn't cover them, we shouldn't just hide the objects but make them accessible on demand. We should also have interfaces that sort of match the beauty of our objects. 
Sometimes in visualization, um, experts are mostly interested in efficiency, but in this case, we know already from user studies, our interfaces shouldn't be um, a lot more um, less attractive than the objects. We really have to invest a bit into also um, making a beautiful environment for these beautiful objects and data we collect. Right, then again, data is different for different users, so we need strategies for exploration, for analysis, and for storytelling. Uh, these tools, whatever we create, are non-neutral, so they are not something um, that we can just trust in. We need critique of the data we collected, and we need critique of the tools. So to learn about uh, the developments still needed in the future, and to also, um, yes, pra practice the same scholarly um, activities in the digital realm that we have actually cultivated in um, our traditional environments. Right, finally, data in general and digital tools are sometimes relevant. Um, sometimes we just have to um, continue with our uh, work, uh, our scholarly work that is sort of undergirding everything that has created those wonderful biographies and lexica and historical reflections that we built on. In general, that's something that we hope to uh, bring to this workshop. We are looking forward towards an exchange between traditional and digital humanists. The term of post-digital humanities would just imply that we are sort of we have arrived after the digital hype. We know the digital is everywhere. We already also know that digital is no solution to all of our problems. We really have to match um, and exchange the different advantages and the different uh, benefits that uh, are to be found on both sides, uh, on the uh, side of the traditional history approaches to biography and uh, on the side of the new approaches. Right, with this we have arrived at this wonderful conference where we hope to go further with these insights and I hand over to Eva once more to also announce another event that is coming up in a couple of days. So we want to follow up in this series of events uh, in October with a conference together with our sister project. So our project is not the only one that has been funded uh, within this call on intangible and tangible cultural heritage. And there we want to look beyond our project and think about how we can address intangible cultural heritage from different perspectives. And we would already like to invite you, it's not too far away, it's in Maribor on the 23rd of October. If you want to join, we are also having an uh, open call for abstracts. So uh, if you need some more information, please just come to me. Um, we would be happy to have some more people there. And that's it. And we give over to Petra, I guess. Thank you. A warm welcome to all the speakers, listeners, and guests of today's symposium. As the last person to greet you today, perhaps I may allow myself the privilege of omitting all the names, numbers, and factual information then belonging to the protocol of greetings. I will address you in a slightly different way. Still, in my capacity as editor-in-chief of the new Slovenia Biographical Lexicon, which, after all, celebrates, celebrates its 10th anniversary in 2023, and for which a large group of authors and contributors were not less so of editors, collaborators, designers, proofreaders, programmers, etc., is to be thanked. As always, I will it is with special care and thought that I stressed that the work of, for the new Slovenia Biographical Lexicon is a team effort. And the five volumes published in the past decade are certainly a good occasion for celebration. It is also a reason for all of us being here today to listen to the interesting contributions made in the name of biography 
and to observe the results in the settings of the Intervia project, which, among other things, is striving to integrate and harmonize national biographical collections at European level, so that they are accessible to a wider public. If the title of today's symposium took its starting reference from one of the Shakespeare verses, one of the most famous lines is also spoken by Shakespeare's Prospero in The Tempest. I quote, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. End of a quote. A person needs dreams to process all the bad, and for all the good, ideas, hopes, and creativity to arise in the subconscious and conscious mind. The personalities we include in the biographical lexicons have reached for the sky, for the stars, on the basis of their dreams. And just as people have always been drawn to stories, they have also always looked to the sky, to the stars. Interestingly, looking into space is actually looking into the past. Traces of starlight are distant storytellers who are part of the universe's past. And this fact has not yet been changed by any advanced and hitherto known technology of mankind. I cannot get out of my skin without thinking, as a historian, about the traces, the fragments that the past leaves for us to read today. And of course, I cannot do this without mentioning Marc Bloch, who was a French medieval historian and a founding member of the Analyst School of French Social History. In his work entitled The Apology of History or The Profession of the Historian, a so-called handbook for the work of historians, he wrote about the famous metaphor of a good historian who is like a man-eater in a fairy tale on the hunt for the human prey in history. Nevertheless, Bloch also wrote one of the fundamental thoughts that should guide researchers in relation to the historian's profession. The work of the historian begins with a well-articulated and defined present, which means that it is necessary to understand the present with the past, and equally, to understand the past with the present. The deliberate regressive method is one of the Mark Brock's most important principles because, as he himself says, I quote, the ability to understand the living is the most important quality of the historian. But it cannot be acquired in contact, but it can only be acquired in contact with a person present. The object of history is not the past, but man, people in time. The historian begins to work history from behind. And finally, neither is possible without looking forward into the future. One cannot do something without vision, hopes, and ideas, without dreams. Besides looking to the past, the futures with new technologies, although they do not yet offer all the answers, bring us new possibilities, new hopes, and of course, new questions. Let me just conclude with wishing you a pleasant conference, which will brighten up some of the starry autumn skies we share. Thank you.